Senator Graham. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, July the 21st, 1993. I yeah. certainly don't want you to have to lay out a test here in the abstract, which might determine what your vote or your test would be in a case you have yet to see that may well come before the Supreme Court. That was wise counsel by Senator Lee in the Ginsburg confirmation. Uh, very directly, did you ever knowingly participate in stealing anything from Senator Lee or any other senator? Uh, no. Did you ever know that you were dealing with anything that was stolen property? No. Uh, as to the terrorist surveillance program, did you help create this program? No. Did you give legal advice about it? No. Thank you. Uh, We're referring to the same program yes, I was talking about yes, there. Yes, uh, the one that the article was about. So a, a bit of a kind of a run through here. You're probably going to get 55 votes. I don't know, 54 to 56 or 57. I don't know what the number will be. There are 11 undecided senators before the hearing. Three of them are Republicans. I like your chances. Eight of them are Democrat. You're in play with about five or six of them. And I just want you and your family to know that in other times, someone like you would probably get 90 votes. I want your daughters to know that what happened yesterday is unique to the times that we live in. And I want to give you a chance to say some things to the people who have attended this hearing. I think there's a father uh, of a uh, Parkland student who was killed. I think there's a mother of a child who has got terrible health care problems. And there are many other people here uh, with personal situations. Uh, what would you like to say to them, if anything, about your job as a Supreme Court justice? Well, Senator, I um, understand the real world effects of our decisions. Uh, in my uh, job as a judge for the last 12 years, I've gone out of my way in my opinions and at oral arguments, if you listen to oral arguments, to make clear to everyone before me that I understand uh, the situation, the circumstances, the facts. For example, as I was saying to Senator Feinstein earlier uh, in the uh, Heller 2 case about the facts in D.C. And um, I, I want to reassure everyone that I base my decisions on the law, but I do so with an awareness of the facts and an awareness of the real world consequences. And I've not lived in a bubble. And I understand how passionately people feel about particular issues. And I ha understand how personally people are affected by issues. And I understand the uh, difficulties that people have in America. I understand, for example, uh, well, to start, I understand the situation of homeless people because I see them on a regular basis when I'm serving meals. So and tell me about that. What interaction do you have with homeless people? Uh, Senator, I, I regularly serve meals at Catholic Charities at 10th and G with Father John Ensler, who's the head of Catholic Charities DC, and I've known since I was nine years old when I was an altar boy. He was a little flower parish. And what you learn when you're at, uh, you know, I said I'm a Matthew 25, try to follow the, the lesson of serving the least fortunate among us. You know, when I was hungry, you gave me food, thirsty, you gave me f uh, drink, stranger, and you welcomed me, naked, and you clothed me, sick, and you cared for me, in prison, and you visited me. Six, six groups that uh, that's not exclusive, but that's a good place to start with your charitable works and your private time. So describe and, the difference between Brett Kavanaugh, the man, and Brett Kavanaugh, the judge. Well, as a, as a man, I'm trying to do what I can in community service as a dad, as a coach, as a volunteer, as a teacher, as a husband, and serving meals to the homeless. The one thing, Senator, you, you know, we're all God's children. We're all equal. People have gotten there because uh, maybe they have a mental illness. Maybe they had a terrible family situation. 
Maybe they didn't have anyone to care for. Maybe they lost a job and had no family. But every person you serve a meal to is just as good as, as me or better, frankly, because they've, uh, what they've had to go through on a daily basis just to get a meal. And you talk to them. That's the other thing. When you're walking by the street, you see people, and I understand, I'm sure I've done this, I'm not, I don't want to sound better uh, than someone describing this, but you, know, you, you don't necessarily look and you don't say, How, how's it going? Right. But when you serve meals to them, and you, you talk to people who are homeless and they are uh, just as human and just as good people as, as all of us. And they're, you know, we're all part of one community. And so I think about uh, that and, you know, I'm gonna, I don't wanna sound like I'm, I can always do more and more and do better. I know I fall short, but Father John has been a big influence on that and thinking about others. So that's as a, as a person. Uh, I try to do Washington Jesuit Academy. So I tutor up there. I'm now on the board of Washington Jesuit Academy. That's a little different situation. Okay, those are low-income boys from low-income families, tuition-free school, one of these 7.30 a.m. to 7 schools. And I started tutoring up there because uh, I wanted to do some more tutoring and just be involved more. I mean, judging's important, but I wanted to be more directly involved in the com community. And they had a tutoring, uh, you do all your homework there because it was a situation you don't want to go home and have anything else to do. You get three meals there and you do your homework there and to help them do their homework. And you see these great kids and they're in a structured environment and you make an effect in their lives. And, and like I said yesterday, the teachers and coaches throughout America, they change lives. And for me to be able to participate, uh, you know, you, you can't change everything at once, but just changing one life, one meal one day at the shelter or one, one uh, kid that, that remembers something you said in a tutoring program, you know, if we all did that more, and I fall short too, I know, and I want to do more on that front, but you can make a big difference in people's, in people's lives. I just bring that into the judging. I think I judge based on the law, but how does that affect me as a, ju as a judge? I think, I, first of all, just standing in the shoes of others. Uh, we could all be that homeless person. We could all be that uh, kid who needs a, a more structured uh, educational environment. And one of the things I was taught by my mom, but also I remember Chris Abel, my sixth grade English teacher and religion teacher uh, and football coach and baseball coach, one of his, uh, and he drove me to school, uh, one of his, uh, and he's now on the board of Washington Jesuit Academy with me, but one of his lessons in To Kill a Mockingbird was to stand in the shoes of others. And I still have the To Kill a Mockingbird that we used in sixth grade. It's in my chambers. Still, the same copy. And is it fair to say that your job as a judge is to not so much stand in the shoes of somebody you're sympathetic to, but stand in the shoes of the law? You're in the shoes of the law, but with awareness of the impacts of your decisions. Right. And that's, what's, that's the critical distinction. You can't uh, be unaware when you write an opinion. How's it going to affect people? Right. And understand, try to explain. I think right. you know, the, it's explaining is such an important feature. And then when people come into the courtroom and how you treat litigants. So we are, we're all familiar. Uh, we've all been in courtrooms where the judge is acting a little too full of being a judge uh, and to, uh, well, we've all been there. I try not to do that. I can't say I'm perfect, but I try to make sure the litigants understand that I, I get it, whether it's a criminal defendant case. Uh, we had a pro se case, pro se case where a litigant comes in and argues pro se in our court, which rarely happens in our court where the pro se actually argues. And it was uh, a guy who uh, said he had been called the N-word by a supervisor. And he's arguing pro se, and the question's whether a in single instance of the N-word constitutes racial harassment under the civil rights laws. And uh, I wrote a separate opinion explaining, yes, a single instance of the N-word does constitute a racially uh, hostile work environment. And I explained in doing that, I explained the history of racism in this country and, and, that, and how um, that word, no, no other word in the English language so powerfully or instantly calls to mind 
our country's long and brutal struggle against racism, I wrote in that opinion. And, and I cited To Kill a Mockingbird in that opinion, among other things. But I, what I wanted to make clear uh, by bringing this example up is um, I understood his situation. I tried to understand what that would, would uh, be like, and I decided the case based on the law. But I understood and with the pro se litigant, the point being uh, I always try to be aware you, of the facts you, and circumstances. Have you ever made a legal decision that personally was upsetting to you? Well, I'm sure I have, and that's what Justice Kennedy uh, talked about in Texas versus Johnson. That, that case, in case people didn't know what I was referring to on Texas versus Johnson, that's the flag burning case. And uh, Justice Kennedy is in the majority with Justice Scalia and Justice Brennan, and Justice Marshall, and, um, and says that. Uh, a law against flag burning is unconstitutional under the First Amendment. And that obviously tore Justice K Kennedy, you know, really bothered him because he's such a patriot. But he still ruled the way he did because he read the First Amendment to compel that result. And that's why he wrote that great concurrence in that case. And that, that concurrence is such a great model for judging and a great model of independence and a great model, to your point, Senator Graham, of we follow the law, uh, but we're aware, we're aware. And it's, you're a better judge if you're aware. Well, I would just want to say this to, to my colleagues. <clears throat> Everything he said, I think, has been verified by the people who know him the best. I can't say I've read 307 of your opinions. I can tell you without hesitation, I have not. <laughs> I did not read Sotomayor opinions or Kagan's writings. But what I chose to do was look at the people who knew them the best. And I think Bob Bennett, who defended President Clinton during impeachment, I know him very well, said that Brett is a judge's judge, someone doing his absolute best to follow the law rather than his policy preferences. Uh, Brett is an all-star in both his professional and his personal life. I've yet to find anybody that I find credible, or really anybody at all, that would suggest that you were unfair to litigants. I've yet to find a colleague that thought you were a politician in a robe, but you are a Republican. Is that true? I, I, I registered. Was a, okay. Yeah. The only reason I'm glad to hear you say that, that makes, <laughs> makes a lot of sense, given who you work for. And <laughs> I, uh, I haven't, well, I'll let you finish your question. Well, you work for a lot of Republicans. Like yes. the president, who was a Republican, so President Bush, yeah, uh, worked for, yes, yeah. So that's that's all fine. So I remember, I remember, I, I'll tell you what I remember when she leaves. So I asked Elena Kagan about a statement that Greg Craig made. Do you know Greg Craig by any chance? Uh, I, I've met him. I haven't seen him in many years, but yes. He was the, uh, one of the defenders of President Clinton during the impeachment hearing. And somewhere in here, I've got Greg Craig's statement about Kagan. This is the Graham Kagan exchange. No, I'm looking for Greg Craig's statement. Here we go. Here's what. Uh, Kagan was a progressive in the mold of Obama himself. Elena Kagan is clearly a legal progressive and comes from the progressive side of the spectrum, according to Ronald Klein. The first was Greg Craig. And I had an exchange with uh, Justice Kagan when she was the nominee. Uh, I'm not trying to trick you. I don't have anything on Greg. <laughs> He said on May 16th that you're largely progressive in the mold of Obama himself. Do you agree with that, Ms. Kagan? Senator Graham, you know in terms of my political views, I've been a Democrat all my life. I worked for two Democrat presidents, and that is what my political views are. And I asked, would you consider your political views progressive, Ms. Kagan? My political views are generally progressive which is true. I really appreciate what she said because I expect President Obama to go to someone like Elena Kagan, who is progressive, shares his general view of judging, 
and who happen to be highly qualified. Sotomayor. President Obama nominated Sotomayor because he wanted someone whose philosophy of judging was his, which is applied to the law and constitutional principles, was be ready to adopt them to a modern context. So President Obama nominated, nominated Sotomayor because he wanted someone whose philosophy of judging was his. I expect that to happen. If Donald Trump is president in 2020, he'll be our next president. If it's somebody else, I expect that to happen. To my colleagues on the other side, what do you really expect? You should celebrate, <coughs> even though you don't vote for him, and I don't know why you wouldn't, the quality of the man chosen by President Obama. Elena Kagan and Sotomayor came from the progressive wing of the judging world and of legal thought. They're absolutely highly qualified, good, decent people. And they got, let's see if I can find the vote totals. Ms. Kagan got 63 votes and Sonia Sotomayor got 68. It's gonna bother me that you don't get those numbers, but what bothers me is they should have gotten 90. They should have gotten 95. Anthony Kennedy got 97. Anthony, Anthony Scalia got 98. Ruth Bader Ginsburg got 96. So what's happened? Between then and now, advice and consent has taken on a different meaning. It used to be the understanding of this body that elections have consequences, and you would expect the president who won the election to pick somebody of their philosophy. I promise you that when Strom Thurmond voted for Ruth Bader Ginsburg, he did not agree with her legal philosophy. And I doubt if Senator Lay, he agreed with Justice Scalia. Senator Lay has voted for a lot of Republicans. I have voted for everyone presented since I have been here because I find them to be highly qualified, coming from backgrounds I would expect the president in question to choose from. So as to your qualifications, how long have you been a judge? I've been a judge for 12 years. How many opin opinions have you written? I have written uh, over 300 opinions. Okay. Do you think there's a lot we can learn from those opinions if we spend time looking at them? Uh, yes, I am very proud of my opinions, and I, as I mentioned, I tell people don't just read about the opinions, read the opinions. I'm very proud of them. You were nominated by uh, President Trump on July the 9th, my birthday, which I thought was a pretty good birthday present for somebody who thinks like I do, <laughs> and I think Don may have something to do with that, at 9 o'clock. By 9.23, Chuck Schumer says, I will oppose Judge Kavanaugh. By 9.25, Senator Harris, Trump Supreme Court Justice nominee Judge Kavanaugh represents a direct and fundamental threat to the rights and health care of hundreds of millions of America. Americans. I will oppose his nomination. Elizabeth Warren at 9.55. President uh, Brett Kavanaugh's record as judge and lawyer is clear, hostile to health care for millions, opposed to the CFPB, corporate accountability, thinks President Trump uh, is above the law, on and on and on. Nancy Pelosi at 1011. Bernie Sanders at 1018. If Brett Kavanaugh is confirmed to the Supreme Court, it will have profoundly negative effect on workers' rights, women's rights, and voting rights for the decades to come. All I can say within an hour and 18 minutes of your nomination, you became the biggest threat to democracy in the eyes of some of the most partisan people in the country who would hold Kagan and Sotomayor up as highly qualified and would challenge any Republican dare vote against them. You live in unusual times as I do. You should get more than 90 votes, but you won't. And I am sorry it has gotten to where it has. It's got nothing to do about you. If you don't mind and you don't have to, what did you tell your children yesterday about the hearing? 
they did as they, uh, I'll, I'll tell them what they told me. I think I'll, <laughs> uh, they gave me a big hug and said, good job, daddy. Uh, and Margaret, before she went to bed, made a special trip down and said, give me a special hug. I just wish if we <clears throat> could have a hearing where the, the nominee's kids could show up. Is that asking too much? So what kind of country have we become? None of this happened just a couple of years ago. It's getting worse and worse and worse, and all of us have a con an obligation to try to correct it where we can. Roe v. Wade, are you familiar with the case? I am, Senator. <laughs> <laughs> Can you, in 30 seconds, give me the general holding of Roe v. Wade? Uh, as elaborated upon in Planned Parenthood versus Casey, a woman has a constitutional right, as interpreted by the Supreme Court on the Constitution, to obtain an abortion up to the point of viability, subject to reasonable re regulations by the state, so long as those re reasonable regulations do not constitute an undue burden on the woman's right. Okay, uh, as to how the system works, can you sit down with five, you and four other judges and overrule Roe v. Wade just because you want to? Senator, Roe v. Wade's an important precedent of the Supreme Court, been reaffirmed. But don't you have to have a case as a, I mean, you just can't, yeah. hey, what are, you, what are you doing for lunch? Let's overrule Roe v. Wade. I, 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 it doesn't work that way, right? I, I see what you're asking, yeah, uh, Senator. Right, there's, there's, the way cases come up to us in that context or in other contexts would be a law's can passed. I give it, yeah, can I give you an example because I can do this quicker? Yes. Uh, <laughs> so some state somewhere or some town somewhere passes a law that runs into the face of Roe. Somebody will object. They will go to lower courts, and eventually it might come up to the Supreme Court challenging the foundations of Roe v. Wade. It would take some legislative enactment for that to happen. Is that correct? Uh, that's correct. If there was such an action by a state or a local government challenging Roe, and it came before the Supreme Court, would you listen to both sides? I listen to both sides in every case, Senator. I have for 12 years, yes. When it comes to overruling a longstanding precedent of the court, is there a formula that you use? Uh, Analysis. There, so, uh, f first of all, you start with the notion of precedent. And as I've said to Senator Feinstein, in this context, this is a precedent that's been reaffirmed many times over 45 years, including in Planned Parenthood versus Casey, where they specifically considered whether to overrule and reaffirmed and applied all the stare decisis factors so that, importantly, became precedent on precedent in this, in this context. Uh, but you look at, uh, there are factors you look at whenever you're considering any precedent. So there's a process in place that the court has followed for a very long time. Is that correct? That is correct, Senator. Citizens United. Yes. If somebody said Citizens United has been harmful to the country and made a record that uh, the effects of Citizens United has empowered about 20 or 30 people in the country to run all the elections and some state or locality somewhere passed a, a ban on s soft money, and it got to the court, would you at least listen to the argument that Citizens United needs to be revisited? Well, of course, uh, listen. I listen to all arguments. You have an open mind. You get the briefs and arguments, and some arguments are better than others. Precedent's critically important. It's a foundation of our system, but you listen to all arguments. Okay. Uh, you were, where were you on September 11, 2001? Uh, I was in, uh, initially I was in my then office in the EOB, and then after the first, uh, as I recall, after the first building was hit, I was in the council's office on the second floor of the West Wing for the next few minutes. Then we were all uh, told to go down to the bottom of the West Wing, uh, and then we were all evacuated, and uh, I think I think the thought was Flight 93 might have been heading for the White House. It might have been heading here. And uh, Secret Service, we were being hustled out, and then, then kind of panic, started screaming at us, uh, sprint, run, and we sprinted out. My wife was a few steps ahead of me. She was uh, President Bush's personal aide at the time, 
uh, and we sprinted out. She's wearing a black and white check shirt, I remember. And she, uh, we sprinted out the front gate, uh, kind of into Lafayette Park, uh, and no, no iPhones or anything like that. Blackberries at that point in time, we didn't have that, and our cell phones didn't work, so we were all just kind of out there. And then uh, I remember somehow ending up seeing on TV down more on Connecticut Avenue, there were TVs out. And, Mayflower Hotel. I remember I was with Sarah Taylor, uh, who worked at the White House, and we watched. We were watching as the uh, standing with her when the two uh, when the two buildings when the buildings fell. So when somebody says post 9/11 uh, that we've been at war, and it's called the war on terrorism, do you generally agree with that concept? Uh, I do, Senator, because Congress passed the authorization for use of military force, which is still in effect, and that was passed, of course, on September 14th, 2001, three days later. Let's talk about the law and war. Is there a body of law called the uh, law of armed conflict? There is, there is such a body, Senator. Is there a body of law that's called basic criminal law? Yes, Senator. Are there differences between those two bodies of law? Yes, Senator. From an American citizen's point of view, do your constitutional rights follow you? If you're in Paris, does the Fourth Amendment protect you as an American from your own government? Uh, from your own government, yes. Okay. So if you're in Afghanistan, do your uh, constitutional rights protect you against your own government? If you're an American in Afghanistan, yeah. you have constitutional rights as against the U.S. government. Is there a longstanding? That's, that's right. long settled law. Isn't there also a long settled law that <clears throat> it goes back to the Eisenstrader case? I can't remember the name of it. Yeah, Johnson versus Eisenstrader. Right. That American citizens who collaborate with the enemy have considered enemy combatants. Uh, they can be. Can uh, be. They can be. They're often, some, they're sometimes criminally prosecuted, sometimes treated in the military. Well, let's talk about can be. I think the. Under Supreme Court precedent. Right. Think, yeah. There's a Supreme Court decision that said that American citizens who collaborated with Nazi saboteurs were tried by the military, is that correct? That is correct. I think a couple of them were executed. Yeah. So if anybody doubts, there's a long-standing history in this country that your constitutional rights follow you wherever you go, but you don't have a constitutional right to turn on your own government, collaborate with the enemy of the nation. You'll be treated differently. Uh, What's the name of the case, if you can recall, uh, that reaffirmed the concept that you could hold one of our own as an enemy combatant if they were engaged in terrorist activities in Afghanistan? Are you familiar with that case? Yeah, Hamdi. Okay. So the bottom line is, on every American citizen, know you have constitutional rights, but you do not have a constitutional right to collaborate with the enemy. There's a body of law well-developed long before 9-11 that understood the difference between basic criminal law and the law of armed conflict. Do you understand those differences? I, I do understand that the, they're different bodies of law, of course, Senator. Okay, if you're confirmed, and I believe you will be, what is your hope when all of this is said and done and your time is up, how would you like to be remembered? Uh, a good dad, good judge, uh, good husband. I think he's getting there. <laughs> good husband. <laughs> Thanks, Diane. You helped him a lot. <laughs> Going to be better for you tonight. <laughs> good. I owe you. I owe you. Good son. I'll quickly add. Uh, you know, good friend. I think, I think about the, pillar, the pillars of my life are being a judge, of course, uh, being a teacher. I've done that, and I'm, either way this ends up, I'm going to continue teaching. Uh, coaching, as I mentioned, huge part of my life. Try to continue that. Senator Kennedy advised me when we met, make sure you keep coaching, even if you get, I'm going to follow that. Uh, volunteering and being a dad and a son and a husband 
and being a friend. You know, I talked about my friends yesterday. I didn't really expect, uh, I got a little choked up talking about my friends. But... That was well said. You got to tighten it up because I just ran out of time. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. I can go on, as you know, but I'll stop there. Thank you. We're, we're